Okay, hello, welcome to the first in a brand new series of weekly shows with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. This is The Rest is Politics Question Time. Each week, as well as the regular Wednesday episode, we're going to record an extra show with the purpose of being questioned, grilled, held to account by you, our wonderful listeners. And over the course of about half an hour or so, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can, and they can be about anything that you like. So, Rory, first question, you fire off. Okay, well, I think we've just, we've got an amazing range of questions. Let's just sort of begin by paying tribute to the fact that sometimes we're getting 700 questions and they are just phenomenal. And it's really good of people to keep sending them in. Um, You and I have briefly been talking about Jonathan's question about American gun laws and Helen's question about Brexit. But here's a question from Sam. Do you think you would still have the same political beliefs if you'd had your co-host's upbringing and background? How much do you think your upbringing and background affected your political beliefs? Oh, you first. I think a lot. I think a lot. I think it, it is, it is a, an issue. And of course, it's an issue for a lot of voters traditionally. Many people vote the same way their parents do. Mm. It's, it's, it's not as true now as it necessarily was in the past, but it's a big determinant of where you vote. I think it has a, and it might be that you're rebelling against your parents, or it might be that you're agreeing with them, but that has a huge formative influence. And I, yeah, I grew up in a family where my father was born in 1922. So was mine. There we are. Yeah. Same age and would have had a, a different kind of experience, I guess. And they would have come from different places with different visions of the world. And that would have formed it. In the case of my father, I think, very formed by being in the army, missed the army after the war and had been, actually, he'd been a British colonial officer during the uh, British Empire from 1957 until Malaya went independent. And that probably had a very, very big shaping influence, although he voted Labour, interestingly. He voted Labour in 45. So he voted against Churchill in 45. That was the last time he voted Labour. My, my parents would have voted Tory and Labour at different points. I wasn't raised in a very political household, but I'd say I was raised in a very values-oriented family, both my immediate family and the extended family, um, on both sides, actually. My dad, who was a son of a crofter, my mother, who was a farmer's daughter, but both sides were very kind of community, very values-based, very kind of right and wrong, very all that stuff. And was is that, Do you have sort of Presbyterian Scottish background there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's quite that's quite quite moralistic, isn't it? Yes, it is, but also I think that often takes some people to the right. I actually think if I think back to my childhood, I we, we I, I was born in Keithley in Yorkshire and I had to walk to get to school through this area that was that was very very Asian. And I really liked the people and I used to stop and talk to them and and I couldn't and I've never understood I, this may sound incredibly naive I've never un- really understood racism. And I think as I then grew up, I realised that most racists were on the right. Yeah. And I think, I, I think that, that was a lot of the... For- and my parents hated racism as well. I grew up uh, as a child in Malaysia, which was an incredibly multi-ethnic community when I was six, seven, which isn't true in Malaysia now. Muslim friends of mine would go to Hindu festivals, go to Chinese festivals. We'd go to everybody's festivals. People would come to Christmas with us. We'd go to Deepwali. We'd celebrate Eid together. And that, very sadly, actually, in Malaysia is now falling apart. But I agree with you. I I didn't, I think one of the reasons that, and one of the other questions actually we've got is is whether we've, and I'm going to get you on this, whether what your most right-wing view is, what my most (laughs) left-wing view is. But I've definitely never really felt um, emotionally the problem that some of my colleagues feel with immigration. That's never been part of my political complexion. Go on, what's your your most left-wing view? Well, the thing I got in most trouble for was my views on prisons. For example, I wanted to get rid of short sentences in prisons. I wanted to make sure that nobody could be sent to prison for minor crimes. And I, in fact, I should get, I should get hold of the copy of the paper. It's probably my greatest achievement as a junior minister was I managed two big front pages. Uh, this is a question from Will actually about political beliefs, uh, saying minister gives green light to criminals. I, I also remember, um, the, <laughs> a sketch writer coming in to see me performing in the House of Commons. And he said that hearing me speak as a conservative Secretary of State to my backbenchers was like that show, The Producers. Do you remember when people set out to try to produce <laughs> the, wor- yeah, the worst yeah. possible musical that could ever be put on? They come up with something called Springtime for Hitler. If you, if you look behind me, Rory, you can see on that far 
there's a picture of me, Ed Victor, my agent, Alan Yentob and Mel Brooks. And we did a show to raise money for a cancer charity. So there you there go. There we are. So there we are. So Quentin Letts said, watching me speak to the Conservative I, I refuse to allow the name Quentin Letts to appear on this podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't have that. <laughs> he said it was like watching a show of the producers, that I literally said everything wrong. <laughs> so David Amos, who was a, a lovely man, but was very much a strong Brexiteer and a great optimist, said to me, could you please tell us what the great trade advantages we will be able to get after leaving the European Union? And according to Quentin Letts, I put on my most po-faced and pedantic expression and said, I would want the honourable member to think very carefully about the very difficult tariff and quota regulations. Leaving. <laughs> and then the next person stood up and said um, something essentially trying to encourage me to do the kind of projects that Quentin Letts said conservatives favoured, such as explaining the laws of cricket to pygmies, he said, was the kind of international development project. At <laughs> which point I said, I would like to double the spend on climate and the environment. Right? And he's, he describes the total silence in the conservative benches and the sort of cheers going up from Labour and Lib Dem opposite me. Anyway, let me put Will's question to you. What's your most, what's your most right-wing view? Before you do, another question on prisons. Winona Ingle. Will we ever see a rehabilitative criminal justice system like we have in Norway? And I'm going to give another plug to Angela Kerwin's book called Criminal, which calls for exactly that. And you and I agree with that. So there's, there's no point. I don't know what my a right wing view. I mean, look, put it this way. In the days when Labour was in favour of unilateral disarmament, I wasn't. I've always been somebody who really, really believes in strong defence. Um, I no longer consider that to be a right wing position, but traditionally through my life, it has been. I actually think there's a lot of shredding defence, but I'd say that is probably where traditionally maybe I'd have felt more, more right wing than most of the Labour Party. Is that partly your brother was a soldier? Was that something your parents would have shared, a kind of sort of patriotic thing? No, I don't th I think I just think I just think we need to have strong defence. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, you know, you look at what's happening now. I never bought that idea that if we all sat around the table and held hands and sang Kumbaya, that we'd all sort of have a great peaceful world. There was always going to be a Putin coming down the block. And I, I had the privilege of talking to your friend, uh, Neil Kinnock, recently, briefly. And I noticed that he often talks about patriotism, about the mm. Labour Party being the party of patriotism. And th that's really important, isn't it, to the history sure. of the Labour Party and actually part of the problems that people have with Jeremy Corbyn. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's funny how much Neil comes up on this podcast. And he also, he sends, he listens regularly, Rory, and he sends regular uh, assessments, as he does of my new European column. And he did say at the end of his assessment this week, I really think you need to take Rory to a Burnley game. So I hope we can do that at some point. Uh, I'll explain the rules. I'll explain what's going on. <laughs> my I've got to say my favourite question this week, Rory, was actually somebody said, ask Rory if he knows anything about rugby league. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about rugby league. Do you know okay. a lot about rugby league? I know a lot about rugby league. I love rugby league. My the, the my favourite question this week, I've got one really serious and one quite funny. The really serious one, and I think it's the name George Orwell that made it my favourite question, Sharon Dakin. My father-in-law was called Henry Dakin. He was Eric Blair, George Orwell's nephew. He saved George Orwell from drowning in a whirlpool off Jura. He died during COVID. We were not able to give him a proper send-off. I've written to my MP. They just tell me to move on. What more can I do? That's very sad. That's very horrific, sad. isn't it? And that's, that's, I think, why this party thing is really, really still cutting through to people. The, the, the less serious, <laughs> David Edmont said he really liked your observation that Parliament is French for talking shop. Yeah. And could we, as we're both linguists, could we give more examples of things like that? So okay. I want to give you a little question, quiz question, Rory. Why, yep. when you go to the tennis, yep. do they say 15 love? Oh, my Lord. I've never thought about that at all. I've got no idea. The reason they do that is back in the day when all the posh public school boys were out playing their fancy tennis game and they all liked to speak French. And in French tennis, the score for zero was Luff, egg, because zero is shaped like egg. Wow. Luff. So they're actually saying 15 Luff. <laughs> wow. That's there a, you go. That's a, very, that's a very good one. Okay, here's one I'm going to put you on the back foot on. So James has written it saying, Rory asking his son to turn the pages more quietly while reading Treasure Island a few
few weeks back got me thinking, what were your favourite books when you were children? I have a two-year-old and a newborn, so I'm curious and open to suggestions. I think I have to differentiate between the books I remember as a parent, in which case I've got to go for Shirley Hughes uh, and the Alfie series, because all of my children love that. I've got to be honest, as a child, the books that I remember the most growing up were the ones that my auntie Nan sent to us every Christmas, which was the broods at Oor Wally. Oor Wally. That's very good. <laughs> Oor Wally's still going. Um, I loved reading Tintin and Asterix growing up. And I, I wonder what it sort of did to me, but it, I think it had a really profound impact on me because it gave me this idea of this kind of um, adventurous Tintin, this obviously adventurous Belgian journalist. But I don't think I really understood he was Belgian with Captain Haddock going around adventures around the world. In terms of new stuff that's come out um, and that we're reading to kids, I think one thing I would say that's worth doing, which wasn't maybe as easy when Alistair and I were young, is how easy is it to get a book on tape on your phone or on an iPhone and have someone like Stephen Fry reading something really beautifully. I suddenly realized my four-year-old I, uh, had basically memorized the whole of Winnie the Pooh. He'd heard it so often. Wow. You could set him off on a sentence and off he'd go. He'd be able to do Eeyore. Right, we'll have a quick break and then we're going to get through more questions. Lots of them. So welcome back, part two of the Rest is Politics Question Time. Right, let's, let's have a bit of a serious one. We've got lots of young readers. Maria, I'm 16. I'm doing my GCSEs this summer, which has been very stressful. I saw Lord Baker, that's Ken Baker, the former Secretary of State for Education, on Good Morning Britain a few weeks ago, speaking about how GCSEs should be scrapped for various reasons, but mainly because we don't leave school at 16 anymore. Now, I'm a big fan of the baccalaureate. Rory, what about you? I think there's a lot to be said for it. So for those of you who don't follow this stuff, basically what it means is that you have a much, much broader education in places like France, instead of specialising in the way that you know, you and I would have done maybe three A-levels. Uh, nowadays, I think, I guess people do more, but you get a much, much broader education much later. I actually love the American university system too. They have a much, you know, this majoring system, which allows um, you to do, even as an undergraduate, you can do courses in astrophysics and do Greek and do your German. Uh, I was talking to a man who today, who's a friend of mine who managed to do a major in maths and Latin which yeah. wouldn't be possible in Britain. No, absolutely. No, and I, I do think we're so sort of hung up on on the kind of, this was, and I do think this is part of Gove's legacy. I think Gove was trying to relive his own education through today's children uh, and did massive damage. And so I, I would, you know, you have assessment, you have uh, vocational, um, but I think the baccalaureate is the answer. Now, Rory, at uttering idle words, which is, I guess is kind of what we do for a living now, which cabinet position is currently held by the worst person who has ever held that position in our lifetime. Now, uttering idle words, names Boris Johnson, Priti Patel, Nandine Dorries, the Attorney General, and the, the, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, whose name is momentarily escaping me. That's alarming. They're all women, aren't they? Yeah, that's pretty offensive, isn't it? Yeah, but let's try so I'd add to that. But then I'd also add Rob, worst ever. Well, I want to defend Dominic Rob for a second, actually. I've been thinking about him. Obviously, he came from a completely different part of the Conservative Party to me. But as a colleague, he was very, very straight. And I've been thinking about him because I was thinking during the Brexit debate, he was one of the only actually genuinely honest people. I remember challenging him during the leaders' debate. And he was straight out saying, the only way we'll get out of Europe by 31st of October is by proroguing Parliament. Everybody else was denying they'd do it, get elected, and then they do it. And he was completely honest. And I think it's very, very odd that he's sort of remembered now as though he is, because of what happened in Afghanistan, he was uh, on vacation when the Afghanistan evacuation happened. I would say in his defense that that was very, very out of character. In fact, probably the criticism people had from him is that he was one of the most conscientious, hardworking foreign secretaries that anyone had ever had. He was a micromanager and he was very, very tough, but he was very serious and dedicated to his job. And I think Oddly, he is um, a figure where the gap between the public perception of him and the private perception is quite 
right. I, I have a kind of fondness for it. Okay, which I think doesn't interesting. Come across. I, 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 I think it's very hard to call any of the current cabinet honest because I think they're all dishonest in the way that they defend Boris Johnson and what he's done. And I don't have any respect for any of them until they called it out. So one of the reasons why there isn't, you know, and, and this is the, the, the reason why it's so unfair, that list of women, is that Boris Johnson has, not all of them, but many of the people he's put in the cabinet are put there, not because they're talented, but because they're loyal. Mm. And in fact, he deliberately has promoted people who can't be a challenge to him. Because traditionally, in the and this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen the letters going in and the leadership challenge being triggered yet. Traditionally, conservative leaders come out of the cabinet. In fact, almost all of them are people who've been foreign secretary or chancellor before they become leader. Mm. And he's deliberately created a cabinet where it's very difficult to see somebody who's going to win an election there. That's the basic mm. problem that the conservative MPs feel. There are many on the back benches who could do it. And there are many very talented women in the Conservative Party. I'd, for example, say Victoria Prentice, Ginny Keegan, really impressive people. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems for actually getting rid of Boris Johnson is that he's very deliberately filled his cabinet with people that it's difficult to think of winning an election. Talk, talking of one of his cabinet, Tom has asked this question. I recently met Michael Gove through work. I knew he was coming and I was tempted to volley him in the nuts if the opportunity arose. On the day, I got on with him really well and had a productive meeting. Have you ever met another person you despise, but then you happen to quite like them? I think often, unfortunately. Um, it, and partly it's psychological. It's a bit like going to a movie that you've been told is really good and they're being disappointed or going to a movie <laughs> you're told is really bad and think it's great. Um, but no, I mean, African leaders, for example, I, I remember going to see Yosef Kabila, who had run a country for 14 years, which is one of the poorest countries on earth, where 5 million people are being killed in the civil war, just got trillions of dollars of mineral wealth being stolen, unbelievable corruption, and meeting him and just thinking, goodness gracious me, he's much more intelligent, mm. much more charming than I was expecting. And he completely put me on the back foot because mm. I'd gone in to complain to him about the fact that he wasn't holding an election. And all he did was mock me for 15 minutes about Brexit. Mm. I think um, I think I, George Bush has got to go into um, that category as well. I mean, it's it, it, no matter I, I found no matter how much I felt that my basic political outlook ought to despise George W. Bush, I found him on a personal level incredibly likable. Amy, um, can I quickly before Amy just explain? Sorry, that was an obscure reference to Yosef Kabila. He, it's the the president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I, don't, I didn't manage uh, look, to. I, I've done the research, Rory. Ninety three point six percent of our listeners knew that already. <laughs> Amy, how do you view the role of news agencies like Reuters, Agence France Presse, Associated Press in the modern media world? Are they underestimated and undervalued? And this is in re reference to something you said last week about the decline of foreign correspondents. I would argue, yes, they are, and I think they do an incredibly important job, not least in keeping the world informed of the really bad stuff that's going on at the moment. I think that they, they do an incredible job, but even them, I'm sad to say, there are fewer and fewer around the world. I mean, I remember when every place I went, there was an AFP correspondent, there was a Reuters correspondent. So something's going wrong with the economics and newspapers. It's not just they're losing their foreign correspondents, but they're losing those guys as well. Here's what question to you from Joe. When ministers talk to international leaders, how do you bring up the question of human rights and other unsavory acts these nations may be doing? No doubt when you're in talks, it's to negotiate good relations and improve trade links. Do you go in hard, bring it up straight away, potentially scuppy your main reason for being there? Or do you take a more softly, softly approach, trying not to offend your opposite number? I'm fascinated by that. I met, I think, I don't know, 15 different heads of state talking about human rights. And every time I went in, I had my talking points to talk about human <laughs> rights. And every time I uh, was really asked the ambassador in the car on the way to the meeting, what do you really want me to do here? Do you actually want me to go in and have a row with him or, my, or her on our first meeting? Or do you want me to achieve this thing on the other side of the bit of paper where you're trying to ask, you know, President Magafuli in Tanzania not to fine a British company 400 million or you're trying to get a British citizen released from jail? What, what's your priority here? And the answer is the ambassadors could never answer me. Well, I, I can tell you an extraordinary story about this. At the time of the Hong Kong handover, which was an extraordinary event, absolutely one of the most extraordinary events I went to, and Chris Patton was virtually in tears, Prince Charles was virtually in tears, it felt like a terrible moment of decline for the British Empire, which of course it was. 
And we were having a meeting with the, the president and we got the word that the meeting would have to be at their venue where they were because they now saw themselves as the power and we had to go to them. And we get on this boat. It was an incredibly sort of stormy night. And all our press has been interested in the briefing I did before. And will the prime minister raise a question of human rights? Will he press him on human rights? Will he press him on, you know, what, uh, two countries, one system, etc.? Of course, the prime minister will raise human rights. The prime minister always raises human rights in his discussions with his Chinese counterparts, blah, 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 blah. We get there, whole array of Chinese guys there. And Tony Blair, Robin Cook, John Holmes, Jonathan Powell, me. There's a, there's a few of us, right? I'm sitting... <laughs> but next to Robbie Cook and John Holmes, Tony's foreign affairs advisor. And they're chatting away and they're reading each other their talking points and it's all through interpreters and it's all taking a very long time and it's all polite, etc. And <laughs> I know that Tony doesn't want to do a sort of full on rant about human rights, partly because he knows that the guy's just not going to really listen. But equally, he knows I've got to be able to go out and say at least something about what he said about raising human rights. So at one point, Tony sort of in his best diplomatic, Tony, as only Tony Blaker, uh, Mr. President, there's just ah, there's one other thing which I think at this point it might be relevant if I could just possibly just raise this in the spirit that we're trying to develop here of cooperation as we move forward in this very exciting new era for both of our countries. And that's the issue of, and I promise you, as the H on human was forming, Li Pang, the Prime Minister, took a handkerchief out of his pocket and he went <laughs> and spat into his handkerchief, <laughs> at which point Tony finished raising human rights and off we went. Very interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, it's a very serious issue. And no, I think, sometimes, I think sometimes you do it and you do it vigorously and you have to do it. But I think other times the truth is... And, and Boris Johnson would have been doing this, you know, when he was out recently in the Gulf. You do it, you sort of go through motions and both sides know that you're going through motions. That, that's absolutely right. A lot of the time I'm reading out my stuff on human rights when I was a minister. And I remember doing it to Kagami in Rwanda. And you basically got the impression he's just sitting there. He's heard it from me. Yeah. He's heard it from the American foreign minister. He's heard it from the Swede. He's heard it from the Dane. Here we go again. And we get to the end and on it goes. And I think the real question is, what do we really do about it? And that's much more difficult. I turned up in South Sudan, uh, where there's a horrible civil war. And my friend, Mark Green, who was the American administrator around USAID, had just been in to see Salva Kiir, the president. And he'd said to him, this is completely horrifying. If you continue to behave in this way, we are going to cut our development aid. And Salva Kiir turned around and said, that's fine. If you want a million people to starve to death, that's fine. I don't care. Take away your billion dollars of development mm. aid. Mm. And Mark Green was put in that extraordinary position of having to decide, okay, we're going to keep the development aid going, that this man is so evil, so horrifying, but I'm not going to allow him to starve his people so we can make the point. And then the question is, where is the leverage? There was a question today, Roy, um, which I'm desperately trying to find it where I scribbled it down, but I, 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 I did sort of, a, somebody just asked the, blatant, the blunt question. We had lots of questions about Sue Gray's report. But he basically said, when do we wake up to the fact that we're living in a dictatorship? Well, I think we're, it's sort of shabbier and weirder than that, isn't it? I mean, obviously, I'm stupefied that having been criticised for breaking the ministerial code and not resigning over the ministerial code, it now looks like he's decided to announce that he's rewriting the ministerial code so that you don't have to resign for breaking the ministerial code. Mm. But you can only conclude that this is deliberate, that he does this stuff just to wind us up. Mm. Right? I mean, it's so mad. The same with imperial measures. Yeah, well, why would anyone, three months after they failed to resign over the ministerial code, try to change the ministerial code? It's kind of mm. insane. By the way, and on this, just on this imperial measures, Roy, I don't even know what my height is in metric. I am six feet, three inches tall. The idea that you've not been able to go for a pint for the last however oh, many years. Oh, or our road signs are not in miles. I mean, it's just bonkers. Yeah. Now, Rory, I've got, I've got some great five questions which I've picked out, which are all specifically directed at you. All right, go for it. Not me, not both of us, but at you. I want very, very short answers to all okay. of them. Okay. At name already gone, which is a brilliant Twitter handle, would you stand as an independent in Uxbridge? Yes or no? No. LP live tweet, do you regret standing for Change UK, which lacked a big hitter who'd been in government? 
I do regret not standing for Change UK. Do you regret not standing? Yeah, I, I, I never saw Change UK going anywhere. And, and I think I wasn't, I, I don't think it didn't matter how big a hitter you attached to Change UK, it okay. still wasn't going to be going anywhere. Richard Cassidy, would you have liked Rory to have served in a Tony Blair cabinet, which had a majority and hope? Blimey, would I have served in a Tony Blair cabinet, which had majority and hope? I don't think I would have served in a Tony Blair cabinet. Nope. Why not? I mean, you wouldn't have been asked, obviously, but why not? <laughs> oh, not, not least, because I would have had you tacking me about my school every day. You certainly would. Nella Finway, Brad Pitt bought the rights to your life story, Rory, but then decided not to go with it when you joined the Tories. Is it now back on the cards? And who would play you and who would play me? There you go. So I'm going to be played by Judy Dench, and you are going to be played by Danny DeVito. Right. Well, on Judy Dench and Danny DeVito, we end the first ever, this historic broadcast of the first ever episode of The Rest is Politics Question Time. Goodbye from me. See you next week twice. And goodbye from me and see you next week twice too. 